available now if you're interested <laughs> after the lecture. Um, I will uh, go easy on you during the lecture and, and try and get as much information across um, that I was hoping you would have read. Anyway, one of those things, can't be helped. So, tonight, oh, I'll shut that door, yes. Libya, since 1951. Brother leader's view of the world in a grain of sand. Anybody know who I'm quoting there? A view of the world in a grain of sand? <coughs> it's a long dead English poet by the name of William Blake. William Blake, he had visions. He saw things. He saw very big things, often in very small things, such as a grain of sand. It is an appropriate reference for the brother leader, Colonel Gaddafi. Uh, I'll stand up the way so you can see the intro slides. Again, all these slides will be available on the um, Blackboard thingy tomorrow. So you don't really need to make notes unless you want to, and that's fine, just you know, so you can relax or scribble like crazy. Quick introduction then, uh, the state of Libya upon independence. And then, if you remember last week, Egypt, we dealt with three presidents primarily. We had a Nasser bit, a Sadat bit, and a Mubarak bit. Well, the history of Libya since independence really is Gaddafi, 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 which is why we have three sections all bearing his name. Um, regards the spelling, this, in my humble opinion, is the correct spelling of Gaddafi from the Arabic. I don't care, I don't have any preference. If you spell it with a G and two Ds, whatever, I'm not going to mark anybody down if they write about Gaddafi with a different spelling. It's not, it's not relevant. It's accepted practice to have several different spellings of his name. So, three broad sections, the revolutionary years, as I've entitled them, from 1969 to 1984, then the period of greatest isolation, stagnation, and decline in Libya from 84 to 99, and then after 99, the war on terror to the civil war. And then our conclusion, we will look at Libya post-civil war. Are we starting from scratch? So, Libya upon independence. Who has travelled to Libya here? When was that? Were you, were you fighting with the rebels, or was it before the war? Um, it was in February 2011. February 2011. And where were you? In Tripoli. In Tripoli. How was it? Um, well, there was a war starting, so I had to leave. Oh. It's terrible how these things interfere with one's travel plans. Um, we'll pick your brains more, perhaps, in the uh, after the break. <coughs> European colonialism in North Africa was obviously met by the natives with great joy and pleasure. I am, of course, being facetious. But this is always how, in this case, it's an Italian portrayal, but you see similar things in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Algeria. This is the arrival of the enlightened West. A light is being shone into North Africa... And we have the idealized figures here of um, Italy and Ottoman Libya, as we now know it, meeting, shaking in peace and harmony, and all is right with the world. Of course, for anybody who knows even the merest detail of uh, 20th century Libyan history, this was not the case. In spite of the fact that the Italians, or I should say, in spite of the fact that Mussolini referred to Libya as Italy's fourth shore after the others, one, two, and three, Italy referred to North Africa as the fourth shore. The orange line was supposed to indicate greater Libya. It was a grand idea, perhaps, for the Italian powers that be, but it was never really brought to reality. The invasion of Libya itself went very smoothly in the early stages. Um, we will look at the division of Libya, uh, or rather the setup under the <coughs> Ottoman times. But if the Italians imagined that they would be welcomed as liberators, which was the claim in 1911, it's amazing, isn't it, how the European powers framed these things. They were going to Libya to free them from Ottoman oppression. If that had been the case, it's unlikely that the war against Italian occupation would have lasted for 20 years, one would argue. And one of the most famous figures in that resistance war was this man, Omar Mukhtar. He is 
massively important as an icon in Libyan society, even to this day. Both sides claim him as their own during the recent civil war, both Gaddafi loyalists and the opposition. His face is seen on car bumper stickers. It is seen on fridge magnets. There is a street in every city named after him, and posters and billboards uh, advertising anything you can imagine use the image of Omar Mukhtar, and we will come to him again later on. So these are the three Ottoman provinces. This is central, really, to understanding Libya today, in one sense. There's a question often asked, is Libya a state? Is Libya a proper country? Well, after the break in the, uh, the seminar hour, we'll consider perhaps the question of what makes a state a state. Bear that in mind. What is a state? How do we know a country is a country? In the case of Libya, it didn't exist as a country under the Ottomans. When the Italians came, they tried to unite it, but their occupation was so brief and so incomplete that it's hard to argue they were successful in uniting these three very different Ottoman provinces. Cyrenaica, Fezzan, which is all Sahara wasteland, and Tripolitania, named, of course, after Tripoli, which is up around here. Always the biggest city out of these three provinces, and then over here you had Benghazi in Cyrenaica. Um, Cyrenaica, named after uh, the uh, ancient Greek, then Roman city of Cyrene. If anybody remembers the uh, story of Jesus carrying the cross, there is one Simon of Cyrene is instructed to help him carry the cross. It's after the town in Cyrenaica, thus the name. <coughs> so, this is the man. Wonderful photograph. King Idris of Libya. <laughs> Idris came from a family called the Sanusi, and you'll have heard their name mentioned during the recent civil war. He was the grandson of the founder of the Sanusi movement. Now, the Sanusi movement didn't start as a political uh, group, but rather as a spiritual organization. They were not dissimilar to the Wahhabi in Saudi Arabia, insofar as it was a religious revival movement. Uh, Sanusi was from Algeria initially. He travelled across North Africa and into the Arabian Peninsula, preaching a message that uh, the countries of North Africa had become corrupt, they had strayed from the true path, and that they should return to the 7th century ideal vision of Islam under the four rightly guided caliphs. These are the four successors <coughs> of the Prophet Muhammad. In Arabia, he spent a bit of time trying to set up uh, schools and a following, in Arabia, I should say, not Saudi Arabia yet. And when he was in Mecca, he came up against the Wahhabi, and they took exception to the fact that this Sanusi chap from North Africa was not going to toe the party line, so he was expelled. He returned to North Africa to a small oasis called Jaboub, which is in Libya by about 30 miles um, from the Egyptian border, and 150 miles south of the Mediterranean coast. Jaboub became the centre for the Sanusia. They were very active fighting not just the Italians, but also the British in Egypt. They basically would fight anyone that uh, crossed their path. Later, King Idris formed an alliance with the British to fight against the Italians. As a consequence, when Idris was made king of independent Libya, he allied himself very closely with the British and always very anti-Italian. Not surprising, perhaps, given the uh, bloodshed of the war uh, of resistance. Today, often in news reports, you'll see mention of the black flags of Al-Qaeda. The black flag. It's always, if you see a black flag, it's bad news. Well, I'm here to tell you that the black flag is not always for Al-Qaeda, and, and let's not be suckered into these easy judgments. If you see a black flag, it, it could just be the Emirate of Cyrenaica. Um, although, as it only lasted from 1949 to 1951, I think the chances of us seeing it rise again are rather slim. Idris declared himself the Emir of Cyrenaica. He was from eastern Libya. It's also significant. It was always in eastern Libya that the Sanusi had their strongholds. The oasis of Jabub, I've mentioned, and then, of course, the city of Benghazi became the royal capital. <coughs> so he was in charge only of Cyrenaica for these two years. Post-Second World War, obviously, 49 to 51, and then in 1951, under the auspices of the recently founded United Nations, Libya 
is the first country created by the United Nations. The United Nations decides that Libya has got a, a chance of surviving. It puts together these three disparate but contiguous Ottoman provinces and says, there you go, there's your country. So, not a terribly auspicious start, perhaps. And it's pretty much kept the same borders ever since. Um, Gaddafi fought a lot of wars in his time, or rather, he funded a lot of wars in his time, which were fought by allies and others. He came down into Chad here, looking for uranium. There were two wars fought against the Chadians, at least. There was a border war with the Egyptians, with the Tunisians, at the Algerians, you get the message. Anybody who had a border with Libya was fighting with uh, Gaddafi's Libya at some time or another. But that's pretty much as you see it today and since independence. The three Ottoman provinces shoved together. For those of you who like numbers. Um, Libya today is the fourth largest country in Africa and the 17th largest country in the world. Obviously, the vast majority of that is desert. So it is not densely populated, but this doesn't really matter because it's what's under the surface in Libya that matters and has mattered since 1959 when oil was first discovered. Slightly larger than Alaska. I always throw these comparatives in because I understand that people who know Alaska like to know if something's very big or not very big. So it's a great deal larger than Hawaii, we can say, and, and slightly larger than Alaska. Um, 1,700 mile, uh, kilometers rather of coastline. You can see the borders there. You don't need to really take note of these for now. The black flag. Cyrenaica takes center stage. The eastern province was going to be the most prominent province under King Idris because it's where he came from. It's where his loyalties lay. It's where he had the greatest support. So under his reign from uh, 51 to 69, when he was overthrown by Gaddafi, it was always the eastern part of Libya that got most government money. It was the most developed. There was most building work and most funding for schools and the like. Tripoli was always a much bigger city. Uh, Tripoli kind of self-governed for a large period of time under the kingdom. And there we have a map with some places thrown up, if anybody hasn't seen them already. Benghazi here, the royal capital, Tripoli over here, always the bigger, more important commercial city. And this place here, Sirte, otherwise spelled S-I-R-T-E, it's where uh, Gaddafi is from, or a tent just outside. There's nothing here. This is, this is really, uh, there's a, to be fair, there's a little band of green that runs all the way along the coast, but really it's 400 miles of desert there. Sirtica is the name given to the area. And until the Italian occupation, there was no road that connected the east with the west of the country. That is also, I think, very significant, because it meant that people over here never really had communications with people over there. When the Phoenicians came, and I, I hate to drop back a few thousand years here, but when the Phoenicians arrived, they arrived by boat, obviously. Through the Greeks, through the Romans, we've heard of these ancient empires. Well, until 1937, 1937, it was still easier to go from Baida or Tobruk to Tripoli by boat than any other means. That's the mid-20th century. It was in 1937 that the Italians opened a road that went from the border with Tunisia right the way across to the border with Egypt. Now, rather like the big railway that was built in Arabia, the Hejaz Railway by the Ottomans, they said it was to allow pilgrims to travel to Mecca and Medina. Not a bit of it. This road was not really for domestic consumption, but it allowed for troops to move very easily back and forth across the country. Think not always in military terms, but be aware that if a government like Italy in the 1930s is funding a project, it's probably not entirely for pacific reasons, but war is not far away. It's ironic that the final instalment uh, of the road was in the Italian governmental budget for 1942-43. Ironic because in 1942-43 it was actually British troops that used the road to push the Italians all the way back and into Tunisia. So um, it was very good for troop movements, just not the ones that were planning to use it. Um, and that's what it looks like um, 
flying over Libya. You see up here the Jebel Akhtar, Green Mountains. This is where a lot of the uh, resistance fighters would have holed up. And also down here we have, you can just see the yellow line, the border with Tunisia. There's not a great deal there, except, as I said, oil under the sand. Of course, people didn't know that when Libya gained independence. It was one of the poorest countries in the world, certainly the poorest country in Africa, it is reckoned, in 1951. A very young Vice President Nixon here in 1957, meeting King Idris. The importance of this is, again, another Cold War story, and I'm not going to dwell too much on it. We need to move on to Gaddafi, but... The Cold War is very important in our story because it also informed Colonel Gaddafi's view of the world. So when Gaddafi came in in 1969 until his death in 2011, he was always essentially anti-Western. I mean, I'm simplifying terribly, but it was born out of the experience of the Cold War and it was born out of his being inspired by NASA and Pan-Arabism. Um, Nixon travelled to Libya because the Americans had the Wheelis Air Base, which is just outside Tripoli. It's not <coughs> called the Wheelis Air Base anymore, but it was significant as, uh, for a center for American operations at a time in the Cold War when intercontinental ballistic missiles couldn't travel like they could later. So the Americans and the British further east relied on these air bases in case the Cold War turned hot. Idris with NASA... Idris and NASA didn't really see eye to eye. One of them was a monarch, after all, and the other was a leader of a, a military coup in, in Egypt. They didn't see eye to eye, but it was NASA who was Gaddafi's big inspiration. Gaddafi wrote to NASA after the coup of 1969 and said, almost like a love letter, he said, everything we did, we did for you. It's rather kind of a little cloying to see Gaddafi kind of saying to NASA, it's all for you, whatever you want, my darling. Um, and then, of course, sadly for Gaddafi, Nasser was dead in less than a year after the coup. So Gaddafi himself took up the mantle of the great leader of the Arab world, although he never had the charisma, um, certainly had the uh, novelty effect, but never the charisma of Nasser. So we move on to the revolutionary years. A putsch, political apathy, and the Green Book. The putsch first. There he is as a young man. He was a captain at the time of the, uh, the putsch or military coup, Captain Gaddafi. And I have to say, whatever you think of Gaddafi and whatever madness he may have got up to at a later stage in his life, it takes a certain kind of young... He was 27. A 27-year-old captain who thinks, you know what, I'm going to take over this country. I mean, lots of people might dream that, but at 27 years of age with his band of brothers to think that they could quite legitimately overthrow the king and rule Libya, it shows a degree of chutzpah, which is, you know, quite outstanding. They achieved the coup almost bloodlessly. It's a very interesting question as to how they did it. They were all junior officers. All junior officers. When the coup or putsch took place, there we know for a fact there were at least three other plots in place against the king. It's not that the king was a terribly bad man, but he was very ineffectual. He was relatively old and he was tired. The king really wasn't interested in being king for very much longer. So there was a plot uh, in place among senior army officers. This is the far more likely one. The CIA knew about this plot, and the British Secret Service knew about the plot. Senior army officers. That's where you expect the trouble to come from. There was another one from um, businessmen, essentially the, the money men, who had seen oil revenues coming into the country and thought, we could probably do things differently. But no, it was the young officers who did it. And they did it, I think, primarily by surprise, because for all the plots that existed, nobody was looking at them. You know, it's the least likely suspect. The surprise was absolute because also the head of the station chief of the CIA was not in Libya at the time. The head of the uh, British Secret Service was away on holiday. And the king was sailing in the eastern Mediterranean. So there was really nobody around who was on the king's side to stop it happening. It's interesting that it took place on the 1st of September. By the 6th of September, even the Americans had recognized Gaddafi as the new ruler of the country. Now, generally, when you have a military coup these days, 
you can be pretty sure that you'll have to wait a lot longer than six days before America would recognize the legitimacy of your claim. The timing. This is the question about who was in the country and who was missing. There was certainly the most important factor, I think, for them was that the king was away. He had a bad heart. He was traveling for health treatment first to Greece and then to Turkey. But really, it's been suggested that the king knew the coup was going to take place, and it was suggested to him that if he were absent from the country, things would go a lot more easily. I don't know if there's truth in it or not, but it wouldn't surprise me. And finally, a degree of apathy. It's a word which comes up a lot in modern Libyan history, is apathy. Um, we'll see there's a great deal of apathy towards Gaddafi from his loyal subjects and his revolutionary ideas. And when I talk about the revolutionary period of Gaddafi, it's not so much the takeover or the coup, but it's what came next. So this was the flag of Libya under Gaddafi initially. It's a flag that we forget. Same colours you'll see as the Egyptians. He adopted it because it was the flag of Egypt. Everything we did, we did for you, NASA. Um, he even adopted the Egyptian flag without the eagle or stars. <coughs> but Gaddafi realized in these three years, between 1969 and 1972, that he and his fellow young officers simply didn't have the knowledge or the experience that they imagined they did, or, let's say, the capabilities to rule the country. It's more difficult than it might appear from reading the headlines in the Washington Post to run a country. And Gaddafi and his fellow officers discovered this. So in 1972-73, Gaddafi starts getting more and more power to himself. Instead of looking out for more help and more advice, he brings the power all to himself, blaming the faults of the country on those erstwhile friends of his. And one by one, the fellow plotters are removed from positions of power. The political apathy, then. It's important in Libya. Why was there political apathy? Let's go back. I don't want to spoil it by giving you all the answers at once. Why was there political apathy in Libya? Well, remember the three provinces? They've just been slotted together in 1951. Communications from east to west are appalling. The vast majority of people are farmers. And these are not farmers who even drive to a market. These are farmers who make enough for themselves and just for the local market, for their village. They've got no history of political participation. And they've not lived in this country of Libya. What is this country? You know, you have your loyalty to your tribe, you have your loyalty to your village. For most Libyans, the idea that they would pay central tax to the government in Benghazi or Tripoli was ludicrous. Why would they? What do they get for it? There's no paved roads, there's no electric lights in the street. They're self-policing and essentially self-governing. So what are we paying this money for? Well, it turns out nothing. They didn't pay it. 1969 when Gaddafi takes over, oil revenues accounted for 99% of government income. 99%. Oil and petroleum-based products accounted for 100% of Libyan exports. A whole 100%. It's not what you call a diversified economy. And how many people did the oil and gas industry employ? Libyans? 1% of the population were employed in the oil and gas industry. You see this massive disparity between what people are doing and where the money is coming from. It's a very significant factor in the political apathy. Gaddafi certainly wasn't apathetic, as we've said. And there's a reason for that, I think, and it's because he was growing up in the 60s. This is something which perhaps isn't often pointed to. We, we look at the 60s from our American or our, our British lenses, the Western European lenses of the 60s. At the top there it reads, um, US uh, social and political movements. So we have what has been labelled second wave feminism on the rise in the 1960s. We have counterculture, social revolution, gay rights movement, African American civil rights movement, black power, anti-war movement, environmentalism. Even that started way back in the 60s. So all of these things, I think, did inform Gaddafi. I'm not saying that you know, he was a wannabe hippie or was into flower power, but certainly it was the idea of cultures rising up from the grassroots levels that inspired Gaddafi. He'd seen it with Nasser. Nasser didn't come from a rich or well-connected family, and yet he took power. He seized power. He saw an opportunity and took it. These are the images that are going around the world in the 1960s. Are they clear? Are they a bit fuzzy? 
Um, Black Power Salute at the 1968 Olympics, two American runners, uh, Australian, came in second. Um, hippies, the bus, the acid experiments, the uh, merry pranksters driving around the States. Um, anti anti Vietnam War protester handing a flower to a, a, a military policeman who doesn't seem keen to accept it. This photograph actually was taken in um, just down the road in um, Arlington in the late 60s, so a bit of local colour there. And if I stand out of the way, you can see in the bottom right there uh, Black Panthers, the Black Panther movement. Do you notice this flag? Does it look familiar? The Black Panther movement obviously were pan Africanists who uh, considered themselves displaced, living in America. Many of them wanted to secede from America and have an independent African American state within the United States. But this flag of red, black, green is the same as the Libyan flag, except without the star and the sickle moon. Very interesting again when we look at our symbols and what people take. It was an African flag that they wanted. And it was the same one that Gaddafi got rid of. And Arab nationalism. Obviously, that wasn't a big thing in 19... Yes? It was chosen purposefully, or it was, I mean, were they chosen because they chose Libya, or because they just... Pan-African colours. Not because it was Libyan, particularly. It, it's coincidental. But I like coincidences. Um, Arab nationalism, obviously, was not a big driver in the 1960s in America, but I'm, I'm shifting the focus back to our region of interest. Arab nationalism, you see, feeds into all of these very exciting um, movements, social and political movements. And this is Gaddafi. Um, I think it's a, it's a very instructive photograph, this. Gaddafi is in, in London, 1966. This is pre-coup. Um, pre he was in London um, on a mission and wearing very distinctive Arab garb. This was not the common dress of people from North Africa in uh, travel to Western Europe at the time. Gaddafi deliberately adopted this traditional costume to make a statement, to, make a, to stand out on the streets of London. You know, it's a form of rebellion in itself, I suppose, the clothes one chooses to wear if you're standing out. And this, again, reinforces the idea that here, what is he, 20... Uh, 24 years of age when this photograph was taken. 24 years of age, something of a young rebel, although he was in the army. And this is the occasion of him looking less like a rebel, having just taken power with his great hero Nasser, who, as I said, died in 1970. So Gaddafi, after the death of Nasser, decided that he would be the great revolutionary, not just for Libya or North Africa, but for the entire Arab world. Later, of course, when the Arab world decided they didn't want him, he looked south to pan-Africanism, but that we will come to later. So the Green Book. You've all heard of the Green Book, I trust? You all read it? Uh, it's instructive, if not exciting. Um, this is the new flag, of course, that Gaddafi brought in in 1973 when the name changed from the Kingdom of Libya to the country of Libya to the great socialist people's Libyan Arab Jamahriya, which is um, less, doesn't trip off the tongue quite as neatly. Um, and the green flag <laughs> for Islam, bless you. Yeah, I, I don't know, I always look at this flag and I think, imagine if you were a child at school and, and your teacher said, now everybody, we're going to design a new flag today and you submitted this. The teacher would say, you know, must try harder, Johnny. You know, this is not good enough. One colour a flag does not make. But it certainly stands out, it's very distinctive. So the green flag, the green, blo the green book, excuse me. The third universal theory, that's central. This is what Gaddafi referred to. This is his whole political philosophy. This was not a system just for Libya. He was the revolutionary who was introducing it into Libya, but it would suit the whole world. Not just the Islamic world, but the whole world could live according to his Third universal theory, also known as Gaddafiism. <laughs> None too humbly. So, communism and capitalism were the two major alternatives of the day, and that's why his is the third universal theory, outside of these two, which he saw as failing and unfair to the people. Gaddafi's family background was very poor. They were goat herders in the desert. They had nothing. Gaddafi 
for all of his later faults, I would argue as a young man certainly saw himself as a defender of the people, whoever they are, the mass, the underprivileged, the underclass, because he came from them. Obviously, as he grew older, you know what they say about absolute power corrupting absolutely, things change. These are the major inspirations, anyway. Islamic socialism, pan-Arabism, and African nationalism. Although the African nationalism, I would say, came later. Um, and the Green Book was published in several volumes um, from the mid to late, mid-70s to the early 80s. And the African elements became stronger over time. Again, because Arab nations started rejecting Gaddafi. He was too off the wall for many of them. He wanted to get rid of old monarchies, for example. So... If you're a king, you can imagine that you're not going to look too favourably on Gaddafi's claim that they're all illegitimate and should be toppled. It's rather similar claims that, um, I just forgot his name, Bin Laden. <laughs> God, how easy we forget. A similar claim that Bin Laden make about the illegitimacy of um, monarchical states. That we'd be much better living under a system that he dictated. It's a common claim. Um, Gaddafi was not inspired, but he certainly took a degree of um, a degree of learning from the Little Red Book, the quotations from Chairman Mao, known to us in the West as the Little Red Book, a collection of aphorisms that were very popular during China's Cultural Revolution. Um, I won't say that it sold in its millions, but it was distributed in its tens of millions. Um, probably, if we believe. Figures, it's the best selling book of all time after the Bible and Shakespeare, but that's because everybody in China had to have a copy, whether they were illiterate or otherwise. Um, sales of the Green Book were far less, but then the population of Libya is far less than that of China. On independence, Libya's population was no more than 1 million. It might have been as, le as little as 800,000, certainly no more than 1 million. So this is the uh, Gaddafi's Green Book. Al-Qatab al literally green book, with its green cover. And this is the three volumes in one. In which he writes about this thing, which he created. It's not a real Arabic word, it's a, a, a portmanteau word, a, a word, a, a neologism. He, he made it up. <coughs> Jamahariya. It's sort of a mixture of the public and democracy. So translations vary, but it is something like um, state of the masses, um, and Lisa Anderson calls it peopledom. So they're all rather clumsy translations, but you get the point. Gaddafi thought that the people should be able to rule directly. We didn't need government, we didn't need political parties. Everybody should have an equal say in the running of the country. Um, I don't know that it's even a very good idea you know, in, in, in principle, it just doesn't seem to make sense. And obviously, when we, when we look at what happened in Libya, it, it didn't really didn't work too well at all. Direct democracy was his shout. I no central government. The people would rule directly through a series of committees. And the committees would all get together, and the committees would submit their ideas to a central pot of ideas, and then the ideas would filter back to the people. What a nightmare. The basic people's congresses i.e. no opposition parties. In 1952, this is a year after the formation of the Kingdom of Libya, there was a general election in the country. <coughs> king Idris had said that he would have political parties in the country, they could have a parliament, and he would just be the king, such as a head of state like one has in Britain. So 1952 came around, there was an election, and then all political parties were banned, and the election results were thrown out. Um, Gaddafi agreed with King Idris in that respect, that there would be no political parties. It was illegal to form a political party, or indeed any uh, social grouping without the say-so of, the, of uh, Gaddafi. And then there would be the revolutionary committees. Um, I write in brackets here, no privacy. Um, the revolutionary committees came later. These were the committees that checked on the congresses to ensure that direct democracy was being effectively forced on people. Um, if, if that sounds a bit cockeyed, it's because the whole thing... Well, was. Um, the no privacy thing, because the revolutionary committees were essentially um, paid informants. They were paid for by central government, which of course Gaddafi's got rid of. So who is the central government? Well, it's Gaddafi. 
It is estimated that there were 20% of the population working for the revolutionary committees. So everything you said or did, you were never quite sure who you were talking to. It might be your neighbour who was a member of the revolutionary committee. They didn't always advertise the fact. So people learnt very quickly to be jolly careful about speaking out about the brother leader, as he became known, as he called himself. Um, Dirk van der Waal, in this History of Modern Libya, we have put this slide up for those of you who haven't read the book. This is the central point about the Green Book. Describes it as a collection of aphorisms rather than a systematic argument. And indeed it is. Um, this building here, which looks a bit like um, a teepee, a wigwam, is, or was, I should say, it's burnt out now, <laughs> was the headquarters for the Centre for the Propagation of the Green Book. In these offices, they translated the Green Book into scores of languages, and it was sent out all around the world. Uh, Russian was a very popular language. And this is in Benghazi. It's significant that Gaddafi placed the centre of the revolutionary committees and his Green Book organisation in the king's old capital. Gaddafi, although he was from virtually the centre of the country, Sirte, favoured the western side of the country always over the eastern side of the country. From 1969, investment in Benghazi and Cyrenaica, as the old province was called, declined very, very sharply. This was unfortunate for two reasons. One, because most of the oil is in Cyrenaica. And two, because the people in Cyrenaica then didn't feel like they had any claim to being called Libyans. All the money went to Tripoli, to the non-existent central government that wasn't controlled by the brother leader. If this sounds like a bad dream or something from the Wizard of Oz, um, it's because it is at times. Uh, Libya is uh, in a class of its own for its modern politics. It really is in a class of its own. In, I don't know if you can see it here, there is one four-star hotel in Benghazi. Um, the name escapes me at the moment. But if you walk around that hotel back in the day... <coughs> There were banners hanging down every few feet with some of these slogans from the Green Book, sometimes in Arabic or English or Russian. And they were all aphorisms, as he says here, like, uh, the man is the head of the family, but the woman has equal rights. And then you move on, very wise, very wise, and you move on to the next one. And uh, you know, it's just, it's not really a system of government as such. And I think that was central to the problem. Gaddafi invested so much time and energy in promoting the book that... Long, long ago, he failed to see the sense of what was required for the country. And this is the brother leader. And this is what he called himself after 1973. I'm not being funny. I'm not being flippant. Not just being funny or flippant. But he did call himself the brother leader. He was the first among equals. The revolution was for everyone, even if the majority of people were not interested in this revolution. And he was just the first among equals. And here you see the breakdown, the three... Um, three uh, volumes. The first one dealt with the solution of the problem of democracy, and then the solution of the economic problems, and then the social basis. The Green Book is very, very short. Um, I think each volume is less than 100 pages. Um, you, you can probably find it online, download it. It is quite interesting, just to dip into. Um, yeah, try it at bedtime. So after the revolutionary phase, we have the period of isolation, stagnation, and decline. Why? Because of things like this. Now, this picture may not be known to anybody in this room, but it certainly uh, burned onto my imagination uh, when I was younger. This is London, 1984. Just out of shot, so to speak, in the corner where the door is, was the Libyan embassy of the day, or the People's Bureau. They didn't have embassies either. They were People's Bureaus because there was no central government. There was a protest against Gaddafi and his regime outside. There was also a counter-demonstration by members of the Revolutionary Committee outside. It was very clearly orchestrated and planned. On a signal from inside the embassy, the members of the Revolutionary Committee withdrew and somebody from the embassy opens up with a machine gun on the crowd of protesters. Um, it's London, 1984. People don't have guns in London. This was, this was big news. It killed one person, and it was this um, young female police officer, Yvonne Fletcher. She was facing the protesters, and she was shot in the back. You know, when you spray a machine gun around, it's going to hit people. This is before Lockerbie, but it's significant because immediately there was a, a siege around the embassy. 
It was, I think it lasted for three weeks before an agreement was come to with the British government that everybody inside the embassy could leave and be shipped out to Libya, and then all diplomatic relations were broken off. But it wasn't a start. The Gulf of Sidra, you picture Libya in your minds, the coastline, there's a big dip, like a bite taken out of it. That's the Gulf of Sidra. There were incidents taking place there. Gaddafi declared the Gulf of Sidra Libyan territorial waters. This is against maritime law. I mean, the reason that we have international law is that hopefully, if most countries can agree, there is a certain number of miles offshore where you have international territory and, and where it's local territory. So when American and other aircraft were flying over this area, they would be fired upon from time to time. And this started in 1981. So this is going back three years before Yvonne Fletcher. But then... Things escalated from 1986 onwards. By this stage, Gaddafi was already you know, out in the cold with many states, certainly with, with uh, Western states. So American aircraft attack and sink vessels that had fired upon them. 35 people are killed. I think they were all um, from the Libyan Navy, but there may, may have been some others who weren't in the Navy, but certainly that was a major incident. <coughs> 5th of April, the next month, there is a bomb goes off in a nightclub in West Berlin. It kills three people. The significance of that is that the nightclub in West Berlin was used by American servicemen who were based there when they were off duty. So it was definitely targeted to kill American soldiers. 15th of April, in retaliation, um, planes leave from bases in the south of England. And they fly from England to uh, North Africa and they bomb Tripoli. This came up again recently after the Civil War because Gaddafi made a claim then that an adopted daughter of his was killed in this raid. And it turns out that she wasn't. It's a remarkable story that she was a doctor and alive and well until the end of the regime and now, I believe, is um, living in Mauritania. But anyway, this was significant because this, this encouraged Gaddafi to start spending even more freely on anti-US government groups and the IRA. He had been funding the IRA in um, Northern Ireland for, for years, but the funding went up. And the funding also went up to groups in America. I think people forget this, but there were groups trying to bring down the American government. I mean, they might be <coughs> crazies living up in the hills, but they, they are out there, and he was funding them. Gaddafi funded more terrorist organizations, more insurgencies than, I, I think, any other world leader in the late 20th century. And that's before we deal with the wars. And then, of course, there was this. The most memorable and one of the most terrible uh, terrorist attacks in recent years is before 9-11, so I should say. Um, Pan Am Flight 103, which landed on a small village in Scotland called Lockerbie, killing 11 people on the ground. Now, what was important about this, I think, is that it was a, a flight going to America the week, the week of Christmas. So it was going to be flying over the ocean. And it's been suggested that it was supposed to blow up over that ocean rather than on land. Because on land, they were able to collect all the pieces of the plane, and it was the cassette recorder in which the bomb was secreted that led them eventually straight back to Libya. So there was definitive proof that the tools used for this job were Libyan tools. And as much as Gaddafi denied it for a long, long time, he did eventually, in the 2000s, 2003, admit guilt for this attack. So sanctions, this is again a conversion problem. This wasn't 981, Reagan, it's, uh, it's 1981. After Lockerbie, of course, sanctions are, are ramped up tremendously. Now, Gaddafi is able to do everything he does because of all the oil in Libya. We've already said there's a lot of oil in Libya, and he got to spend it very freely. But what they didn't have in Libya was very much in the way of technical know-how. So the majority of people working in the oil and gas industry were foreigners, um, 1981, Reagan invalidates U.S. passports for travel to Libya. This meant that all of the oil and gas men, American oil and gas men, were prevented from working there since 1981. So they all pull out. Eastern Europe starts supplying a number, but Eastern Europe doesn't have the same number of oil and gas men that America has. 82, U.S. bans import of Libyan oil. And then Libya is tied with Iran in the 1996 Sanctions Act. This decade from here on in, crippled Libya. All this oil that they pressed, the UN pressed, 
the EU pressed and America pressed for sanctions that were so crippling. Gaddafi was left with all this useless product. And the country was crippled, quite simply. What he was able to do with foreign assistance, that is technical assistance, was spend his money on grand schemes such as the Great Man-Made River Project. This is a photograph from the Sahara, an area we generally associate with sand and dry places. Well, the Great Man-Made River Project, if you haven't studied it at all, is definitely worth reading up on in some detail. It was a grand scheme, another one of Gaddafi's grand schemes, inspired by people called the Garamantes, who, for a bit of background, were around at the time of the Romans. The Garamantes lived in the central Sahara, the Libyan Sahara, and with slave labour, they were able to dig wells, 100 metres or more underground, to hit the aquifers, and the water would come up from these under-Saharan aquifers. The aquifers are still there, of course, and it's those aquifers that uh, Gaddafi was tapping into. It was a major project, five years before the first water was pumped. Ah. Oh. That was Germa, that was where the um, Garamantians had their, their uh, capital. This, as you can see, is, is, a, is a long way south. It's all desert. Gaddafi called the Great Man-Made River Project the eighth wonder of the world. Phase one came right down here, pumping water all the way up to the coast. Phases 4 or 5 haven't been completed, and it's uncertain whether they ever will. The thing about this great project was that it wasn't wholly unnecessary, but the population of Libya really didn't require the amount of water that was being pumped up. 3.5 million cubic litres a day, I think, was being supplied to Tripoli. I mean, even today, the population of Libya is less than 7 million. It was an, it was an over-ambitious, over-supply idea of his. But what a plan, huh? 1,700 miles of pipeline. They sank 1,300 wells. A lesson from history. This is the Garamantes' capital. What happened to them was, for all the wells they dug underground, and all the support they got, and the pressure from the aquifers dried up. The great man-made river project today is still pumping water up to the coast, but there are those scientists who say its days are limited. So be warned. But hey-ho, Gaddafi, ever optimistic. It's wonderful driving around uh, Libya, at least before the war. You'd often see these posters of him in a sort of triumphant, victorious boxer pose. Um, popular with a lot of North African leaders, actually. Uh, not anymore. So it brings us to the war on terror and the civil war, the last phase Recognise this man? Remember his name? Omar Mukhtar. On a Libyan 10 dinar note. Pre-revolutionary 10 dinar note, I should say. This was the stuff that was missing for many Libyans. Money. Cash. By the time of 9-11-2001, as I said, the uh, sanctions have been in place for, what, nearly two decades. We go back to 81 and the early passport ban. So Libyans were short on money. Not so much the Libyan money, because they could always print more of that. But US dollars, a currency that really meant something. Quick look at population figures. One million. I'm being generous here. Some people say 800,000, but this is on independence. Less than two decades later, almost doubled. So 1.9 million. These are all in millions, by the way. Today, 6.4, up to 6.8. But certainly not more than that. And of those, many are living overseas and are probably never going to return to Libya until things start to improve. It's a significant increase in population, and when they had two decades without foreign investment and without development of the economy outside of mega-projects, like the Great Man-Made River Project, which in itself relied on foreign assistance, uh, technical assistance, the country was on its knees. I just can't resist um, a picture of, of the man in costume. When you look at African leaders very often, particularly the dictators, the military men, there is a cer certain dictator chic which exists um, since the 1960s and 70s. And I think Gaddafi has always led the way in this fashion, with the glasses and the, the, the elaborate epaulets. 
and the unearned medals. Um, he always went one step further, did our Gaddafi, than everybody else. This is a photograph pinned on his chest, and I hope the next slide is a close-up. This is Omar Mukhtar when he was captured by the Italians. He led a resistance war for 20 years, captured, hanged within you know, three days of his capture. Gaddafi wore that uh, photograph on his uh, jacket when he travelled to Rome in 2009 for meetings with the government there, making a very strong statement that I am the leader of Libya, I am resisting any attempts at foreign colonialism. This will not happen to me. This was his statement. He made it very clear. These are people who disagree with Gaddafi, who are also holding I heart Mukhtar posters and I heart Bin Razi and the old flag. Omar Mukhtar remains central to the, the Libyan national myth because the country is so very new, in a sense, if we disregard the Roman and Greek ruins, which are magnificent and completely without equal anywhere in the world. But in modern terms, Mukhtar is basically the one figure that everybody in Libya can identify with as their hero. So what changes for Gaddafi? 2003 is what happens, and the invasion of Iraq. This was a real wake-up call to Gaddafi, and it's one of the few times, an identifiable moment in modern Libyan history, you could point to Gaddafi and say he was wholly rational in his approach to dealing with the rest of the world. Because the invasion of Iraq made Gaddafi think that anybody who was suspected of developing weapons of mass destruction could be invaded. It's interesting that for a moment where Gaddafi was acting wholly rationally in throwing up his hands and saying, I abandon my uh, WND program, the contrawise, the war in Iraq, after it dragged on for so long, was seen by others in the Middle East as evidence that America was not all-powerful. And I think in the Middle East today, and I'm, I'm leaving North Africa for the wider Middle East, there is this opinion that America is either all-powerful and can do anything, or it's impotent and has no power at all. I think both views are mistaken, but that is the black and white view of most people in the region. In Iraq, people said, well, if the country's in such a mess, it's because America wants it to be in a mess for some reason. Because obviously, they can put a man on the moon, and they can get rid of Saddam Hussein, they can clear up this mess. The fact that the country is still in a state of, of uh, dire degradation is part of some cunning evil master plan. Well, of course, you know, there was no plan. That, that's one of the difficulties. But I digress. For Gaddafi, it was enough to persuade him that he should fall into line. He admits guilt for Lockerbie. 30th of April, look at this. Invasion of Iraq in March. April admits guilt for Lockerbie. September, sanctions partially lifted. In December, he's renounced all WMD plans. 2004, American oil companies are bidding for oil and gas concessions in the Libyan desert. Uh, that's another one with this pose. 37 years uh, since the Great Revolution, the People's Revolution. This is what the poster marks in Martyrs Square, as it's called now. This balcony here, interestingly enough, I mean, this is the main square in, in Libya. If I was standing here, behind me, you'd see the Mediterranean. The great big square. It's where all the driving <coughs> around was done during the war. It's where um, Saif al-Islam came out saying, I, have, I haven't been captured, and then... When the regime did topple, it was where most of the celebrating went on. Um, Mussolini appeared from that balcony in the 1930s, 1937, to give a speech, as El Ducci would, was wont to do. Um, and just in here is the uh, Libyan National Museum, Martyr Square, formerly known as Green Square. This chart, if I stand out the way, GDP figures. And you will be able to see these when you download the slides or, or capture the slides. So don't worry about the figures. I think what you need to see is some very big up and downy bits. You can equate these with periods of sanctions, and then from here, 2004, sanctions end, 5, 6, 7, 8, drop, 9, 10, 2011, war. Oil remains central to Libya. <coughs> Libya has the 10th largest proven reserves of oil in the world. It's only, let's see, 80 miles from the Libyan coast to the southern shores of Italy, or Sicily. 80 miles. 
of water. That's wonderful for European energy markets. Libyan oil comes out of the ground almost as pure as pure can be. Other countries have to refine and refine. The Libyan stuff is it's good quality oil. It means that it's much cheaper onto the market. And the longer it's off the market, as it was during the period of um, the 80s and 90s, the worse it is primarily for Europeans. When the Libyan oil wasn't coming through, Europeans increasingly relied on Russian oil. This was not so much of a problem post-Cold War, but it's something to consider again when oil supplies are cut off. Where does your other supply come from? It doesn't really impact so much on America. America doesn't rely on Libyan oil. There are plenty of other sources. But it's important for other places outside of America, which, believe me, exist. Gaddafi's reign in numbers. 42 years in power, supported 42 wars. Not bad going. Um, obviously, I could give you another lecture or three on the wars that he supported. There are at least two wars with Chad, but it wasn't just his neighbours. I say in many more insurgencies. He supported the IRA. He supported uh, rebels in Indonesia. He supported the Sandinista, Nicaragua. He tried to radicalise Maoris in New Zealand to rise up against the government and the Aboriginal people in Australia. This man knew no end to his generosity, his largesse, with the country's oil money. He supported a British fascist party in England, although he hated the British and everything they stood for. The British National Party, a far-right uh, extremist group in Britain, got money from him. Um, he was great friends with Nelson Mandela, interestingly, and you think, oh, really? Oh, God, Mandela, what are you doing? Well, Mandela was in prison for a long time, don't forget. Mandela was part of an African movement to get freedom for the country. So not every story is the same, but it's important to know that Gaddafi was the most influential ruler in Africa uh, of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and O's, I would say. Last 40 years in Africa. Why? Because he had this oil money, and he was spending it freely, interfering in other people's countries. There was a lot of war took place in Africa that came directly out of Tripoli's coffers. So, Conclusion, starting from scratch. If we start from scratch in Libya, it's to assume that there is no history, there's no past, there's nothing to build on. This mound of rubble here, this is the remains of the tomb of Sanusi, the original Sanusi in the oasis of Jaboub. I brought us full circle, rather niftily, I hope, without a seam showing. Gaddafi didn't like any opposition groups and he didn't like anybody to rally around figures. Omar Mukhtar was the exception, but he claimed him as his own. The Sanusia, who fought the Italians and fought the British, had a tomb and a university in the desert devoted to um, Islamic teaching primarily. And Gaddafi had it levelled. He bulldozed the whole thing. The Sanusi remain... Um, the, the guy in the middle isn't one of the Sanusi, by the way. That's me. The other two are part of the Sanusi clan. They remain very important in Cyrenaica because the Sanusi name, it's like a... Well, it's, it's royalty. It's what it is. King Idris was Sanusi. Now, a few people have asked for the return of a royal family in Libya, but I don't believe it's going to happen. There are a lot of things going to happen in Libya. Um, hopefully peace breaking out in the next 18 months, but don't hold your breath. But the Sanusi are important as a clan, and they will remain important. Because Libya isn't quite building from scratch. It has a very small bit of modern history to hold on to. And that's where the Sanusi come in. They're identifiable and people can rally around them. Now, whether they have support in the West or not is the big question. This is Idris, by the way. There are still people, like this young man in Benghazi, who would happily welcome the return of the king. But this sort of support only comes in the east of the country. And with that, I release you from your chains.